friend and colleague, uh, Professor Ollie Johnson. And first of all, I want to thank you and the speaker for showing up at this talk in this awful weather. And, uh, I congratulate uh, the speaker on the sense of professional commitment and all of you for your thirst for knowledge that brought you here uh, at this time. Professor Ollie Johnson has had the kind of academic preparation that is exemplary for a professor in a top-notch university such as Wayne State. He came to us having received credentials from very prestigious institutions earned a BA in Afro-American Studies and International Relations and an and and MA in Brazilian Studies from Brown University, which, as you know, is one of the uh, most prestigious universities in our country. And he then went on and got an MA and a PhD in Political Science from the University of California at Berkeley, which is regarded as some, uh, by some as the Harvard of the West Coast, so uh, he was very, very well credentialed when he came to us here. His first book, Brazilian Party Politics and, uh, and the Coup of 1964, was published in 2001, and he has since co-edited a book entitled Black Political Organizations in the Post-Civil Rights Era, and that was published in 2003. <coughs> In the course of his academic career, Professor Johnson has conducted research on the Black Panther Party, on the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and on other black political groups in the United States. He's also lectured on African American politics in Brazil, in Colombia, in Ecuador, and in Japan. His current research focuses on Afro-Brazilian and Afro-Latin American politics. I'm the director of the Humanity Center, and I owe Professor Orlin Johnson a deep uh, debt of gratitude for being a, a friend and advocate of the Humanity Center. He has given, this is actually his fourth Brownback talk uh, in our series. Uh, before now, he gave one in 2011 on black politics in Latin America. In 2008, he gave one on promoting afro Brazilian culture and history in a racial democracy. In 2006, he gave one on afro Brazilian politics, challenges and opportunities. He has been a member of a Humanity Center working group. He has been a resident scholar in the Humanity Center's um, suite in 2007, 2008, 2009. He served on the Humanity Center Advisory Board from 2011 to 2013. And he won one of our prestigious faculty fellowships um, in our competition centered on the so sovereignty and justice of the law. I think it is very appropriate that a scholar who has studied and written about the history of struggle of black Americans in America and in the diaspora should kick off <coughs> the center's Black History Month programming with a talk about an iconic figure in the black experience in America. All this talk is entitled Malcolm X and the Cuban Revolution. So on this chilly, snowy day, please put your hands together to give a warm welcome to Professor Audie Johnson. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank you so much for coming out in the cold weather. I uh, heard that it might be canceled, and uh, I called some people. I called the center. Nobody answered. But I decided to come because I thought you might be here. And so, again, I'm so happy that you're here. I want to emphasize that I consider Walter Edwards one of the jewels, one of the intellectual jewels of Wayne State University. He, more than any other person I can think of, is committed to uh, 
creating a vibrant intellectual educational environment in which faculty can uh, share their research with students, get feedback from students, and I think that's a good thing. And as he mentioned, I participated actively in the activities of the center and plan to continue. Uh, in part, I've uh, learned a lot from the center because I don't think he mentioned that I also attend these uh, <laughs> sessions with other professors. So I really enjoyed them and I've learned a lot. But we don't have a lot of time, so I want to talk about Malcolm X and the Cuban Revolution. Highlight a few points, give you some context for understanding this topic, and then hopefully engage in some discussion, some uh, critical analysis. Because the ideas I'm presenting now are part of my ongoing research on Malcolm X and the Cuban Revolution. Malcolm X was one of the greatest uh, African American leaders of all time. And I think if I had to choose one word to describe him, I would say he was a revolutionary. Which is to say that he was committed to fundamental and radical change here within the United States. Now this is important to emphasize because there's some controversy about that. Not everybody sees Malcolm X as fundamentally a revolutionary. A couple years ago, Manny Marable, a distinguished historian, uh, came out with a biography, a very long, thorough biography of Malcolm X. Let me get a show of hands. How many people read it? Good, good, good. Because this was uh, an important book and a controversial book because to some degree, uh, readers felt that Manning Marable, a distinguished historian in his own right, was downplaying Malcolm X's revolutionary commitment and his credentials and uh, made unnecessary mention of some personal aspects of his life that uh, are still controversial today. And uh, I don't think I was as critical of the book as some other people, but I did have questions. But I did have questions. And so on the question of to what degree was Malcolm X revolutionary? I think Manny Marable says he was revolutionary, but then some of the things he mentions in that context are a little, a little problematic. And so I just want to reiterate that Malcolm X was a revolutionary and that he was committed to fundamental change in the United States and that as such, he was open and committed to working with other revolutionaries in the United States and around the world. One of Malcolm X's main criticisms of the United States was a systemic criticism. He argued that the United States was not only a racist country, but an imperialist country. That it was fundamentally an authoritarian country. As a country. Not one little policy here, not one little institution there, he had a systemic critique of the United States political system, economic system, social system. And so this is important to recognize. He believed 
that this system that has been oppressing black people for hundreds of years, which has been exploiting black, brown, yellow, and white people all over the world for hundreds of years, had to be changed. And so this is why he rarely referred to American ideals as something that we should aspire to, that we, that everything will be okay if uh, we go back to the, the basic goodness of the country or the basic rightness of the founding document. Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, Emancipation Proclamation, things like that. And this is important to consider because Martin Luther King, one of the other most important black political leaders <coughs> of all time, often referred to those ideals. That the country's on the wrong path but if we can get back to the basic goodness of the country. And so that's one of the contrasts between those two leaders. Even though Martin Luther King, in the last years of his life, also considers himself a revolutionary. Martin Luther King considers himself a revolutionary and said, among other things, the United States of America is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. That's Martin Luther King Jr. And that statement sounds like it could come from Malcolm X. And so that just is a little piece of evidence to support people who argue that they were converging, coming together, at least in some aspects of their political ideologies and philosophies at the end of their lives. What were some other aspects of what a revolution meant for Malcolm X? I already mentioned fundamental systemic change. In the service of freedom, justice, and equality. He said revolutions were about land. He said revolutions were violent. Malcolm X always believed in armed self-defense. He did not believe <coughs> in turning the other cheek. You smack me on my right cheek, I give you my left cheek. No, that wasn't Malcolm X. You smack me on my right cheek, I cut your hand off. That was Malcolm X. It just so happens <coughs> at the peak of his popularity in the late 50s, early 1960s, <coughs> the Cuban Revolution occurred. The Cuban Revolution triumphed January 1959. Del Castro and his core group of revolutionaries enter the streets of Havana. As soon as it became clear that this was a serious revolution, that the government of Fidel Castro was committed to land reform, breaking down all the uh, structures of racial discrimination and oppression in Cuba, literacy campaign, challenging the United States, not bowing down and being subservient to the United States. As soon as those elements of the Cuban Revolution became clear, Malcolm X publicly supported that revolution. He said, that's a serious revolution. And he went out of his way 
during the early 1960s and said, that's the kind of revolution that we need here in the United States. We don't need a revolution talking about we shall overcome. We don't need a revolution talking about I want to integrate that cup of coffee. I want to sit next to white people. I want to be on the bus. That's not a revolution. That's what his argument was. His argument is about, or his argument in favor of revolution was about land, systemic change, and achieving that change by any means necessary, including violence. Fidel Castro, the leader of the Cuban Revolution, went to the United Nations in 1960 with a Cuban delegation. The United States was not happy about the Cuban Revolution or the presence of Cuban revolutionaries in the United States. So they made them uncomfortable. They disrespected them publicly. Uh, they said, we don't know if we're going to let uh, the Cubans in because they might be bringing chickens and other things with them because they're backwards and from a little rural country. And obviously Fidel Castro and his comrades were outraged. But the most serious outrage was that the uh, Shelbourne Hotel in Midtown Manhattan, one of the top most expensive classy hotels, was charging them an exorbitant rate arguing that they were a security risk. That we didn't know if there was going to be a terrorist attack or what, so we, we have to be, we have to take all precautions. Delegation said, this is outrageous. We're leaving. We will put our tents up in the park, in Central Park if necessary. What did they do? Cuban delegation went to the black community. They went to Harlem and stayed in the famous Hotel Teresa in Harlem. And so Fidel Castro used this experience to strengthen ties with supporters of the Cuban Revolution in the United States. And so for the entire time they were in the United States, Fidel Castro met with heads of state, dignitaries, and also community activists in this hotel. And one of the people we had a meeting with was Malcolm X. One-on-one -on -one meeting in which they were able to <coughs> talk about the importance of each other <coughs> and affirm their uh, solidarity. Some reports say that Fidel invited Malcolm to visit Cuba. Other reports say that Malcolm X invited Fidel to join the Nation of Islam. So we don't, we don't have full, accurate information on what happened. But we know the meeting occurred and that it was a positive meeting. Because keep in mind, this is 1960. One year of the revolution, the Cuban Revolution was very popular in the United States. Not among all sectors, and definitely not among governmental sectors, but among students, among activists, among uh, leftists and progressives, the Cuban Revolution was very powerful, very exciting. And Malcolm was part of that group that supported the Cuban well, unfortunately, shortly after uh, Cubans left the United States, Malcolm X 
ran into major problems within the nation of Islam. How many of you have seen the movie Malcolm X? So I guess all you know the outlines. He was growing in popularity. And some elements within the nation of Islam were not comfortable with that. Thought he was becoming um, too big for his britches, so to speak. That he was becoming kind of a, an internal threat to the honorable Elijah Muhammad. Uh, And so his troubles evolved into a situation in which he wanted to get to what was going on. And he couldn't get clear answers. President John F. Kennedy was assassinated November 1963. Elijah Muhammad is very astute in his own right in terms of black community but larger America and he told all of his ministers not to comment on the death of this president. What did Malcolm X say and do? Instead of being silent, he said that the assassination killing of President, President Kennedy was an example of the chickens coming home to roost. That when you were pose unarmed black people down, when you lynch and murder defenseless people, when you overthrow governments, when you assassinate leaders abroad, bad things will happen to you. So Malcolm X said this assassination of President Kennedy was a type of blowback in which what goes around comes around. This was unacceptable in the nation of Islam, put the nation of Islam at more risk even though it wasn't something new or out of the ordinary. Malcolm X and other ministers were very critical of the American government, and had been. But again, those internal problems that I mentioned earlier exacerbated this conflict with, within the nation of Islam. So, long story short, that was the beginning of Malcolm X's uh, exit from the nation of Islam. He formally left in March of the following year, 1964. Malcolm X, the most important minister in the nation of Islam, left the nation after more than 10 years in 1964. He shortly formed two organizations that would be his vehicles Muslim Mines Incorporated, and the Organization of Afro-American Unity, the OAAU. This was a period of transition for Malcolm X. He was cut off from the resources and infrastructure <coughs> and contacts that he had in the Nation of Islam, and he was creating something new. 
he said that the next day couldn't be everything he wanted to be. He couldn't say everything he wanted to say in the nation of Islam because of their uh, narrow formulations, their uh, narrow black nationalist interpretation of Islam. So he said he was a new man, he was a free man to do and say what he wanted to do. And so what he did was re-emphasize his revolutionary credentials and continue to highlight the Cuban Revolution and the independence movements in Africa as the wave of the future. So what's happening and what's going to continue happening and this is good for America, and we African Americans have to become a part of that tide, that revolutionary tide, uh, sweeping the globe. He continued to speak highly of the Cuban Revolution. But I want to end on this paradoxical note. Malcolm X was always publicly a supporter of the Cuban Revolution. However, at the end of his life, as he was trying to build the organization of Afro-American unity that would be his main political organization, As I mentioned, he was doing a lot of traveling in the United States and around the world. In Paris, November 1964, he met an Afro-Cuban exile named Carlos Moore. Now, Carlos Moore is important because he was born and raised in Cuba but migrated to the United States in the late 50s, New York City. So he heard Malcolm X speak. He was familiar with Malcolm X. He loved Malcolm X, but he didn't like the Nation of Islam. He wasn't down with that religious rigidity. But now that Malcolm X was no longer in the Nation of Islam, he wanted to work with Malcolm X. There's only one complication. <coughs> Carlos Moore had gotten caught up in the revolutionary fervor of the Cuban Revolution. So he returned to Cuba from New York City, spent two years, two and a half years in Cuba being a part of the revolution. He experienced the uh, Bay of Pigs invasion, United States backed invasion of Cuba. But what he found most disturbing in Cuba was that despite all the positive things that the revolution was doing, it wasn't acknowledging his mind, the profound roots of racism and white supremacy in the country. And so Carlos Moore argued that every time he tried to bring up that as revolutionaries, we got to get to the bottom of this. We got to re educate people. We got to not only ban discrimination, which the revolution did, but we got to talk about it. He felt he got nowhere. And so he ended up leaving Cuba again and becoming the most prominent Afro-Cuban critic of the Cuban Revolution. So you see the scenario that I'm setting up, right? Malcolm X, one of the most important black leaders in the world at the time, strong support of the Cuban Revolution, decides to work with one of the chief black critics of the Cuban Revolution 
in building the OAAU in Paris. The potential for this was profound, but it was not to be realized because after Malcolm X visited uh, France and Paris November 1964, he planned to come back in February 1965 to officially inaugurate a chapter of the OAU in Paris because he had given Carlos Moore the mandate to build the OAU or at least lay the foundation for an OAU in Paris and the rest of Europe. Before Malcolm X could return to France, he was assassinated. So he was never able to reconnect with Carlos Moore and his supporters in Paris and build the OAU into something uh, more profound, more effective. After his assassination in the Audubon Ballroom, February 1965, the organization uh, never rebounded and declined shortly thereafter. And so, again, I want to conclude by saying, when we think of Malcolm X, we should think of him as a revolutionary, a supporter of the Cuban Revolution, but also as someone who had the flexibility to work with people who disagree with him on important issues, because you remember, Carlos Moore, already a public, visible critic of the Cuban Revolution. He explained his reasons to Malcolm X. Malcolm X heard what they were saying, what he was saying, and still decided to work together. Unfortunately, they were never able to, to bring it together, but to me that's a important element of the relationship between uh, Malcolm X and the Cuban Revolution. And uh, I'll end here and take any questions and comments you might have on the top. Yes. January 2000, I took 16 study abroad students to Cuba. Had a great time. Wasn't able to meet with Fidel. I asked, they, they laughed at me like Lisa A. smiling. <laughs> like, no, no. Yeah, they probably thought, oh, he, he might try something. Fidel doesn't, yeah. Not, not this time. <laughs> You've been to both ends of the island. This is a, a very different influence when you're in Havana, Camarera, but here in Santiago, it's cool. It's a big difference. Right. No, I uh, was only able, again, two weeks in uh, Havana. And then, short visits around, I mean. But while there, we met with, obviously, uh, government officials, Communist Party officials, uh, academics, intellectuals, people at the university. They have a very famous Martin Luther King Center there. Um, we also walked around Havana and uh, we met uh, just people on the street. And uh, it was so funny. My wife is a journalist. She went with us. And uh, so she's always asking questions. And we came across some brothers, some young black men who were just hanging on the corner. I was like, is this an international phenomenon? Brothers <laughs> hanging on the corner? And so we said who we were, we're just visiting Cuba, what's going on in Cuba, we want to know about Cuba. And we were disappointed 
that they were not happy campers. They said racism is alive and well. And one had dreadlocks. He said, look, you have hair like this. You know, it's not good. Uh, they took us to one of the, the private um, restaurants because the government was transitioning to trying to allow more private businesses to open. And we talked further, but they were, they were pretty critical of the government very unenthusiastic, and so. I've seen it. So you've been to Cuba many times? I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. Okay. It's, it's, it's kind of reflect. It's a reflection of the United States. If you get, if you've been to jail once, you can never work in the tourist section. You can't get a lot of jobs, and there are a lot of black faces, but not in the government level. When you look at the hierarchy, there are none in the upper level. And sometimes it's kind of like, um, I won't say nepotism, but people promote people that they know. So some people will always hit a ceiling and never be able to go further. And I was actually shocked at how many times I saw people getting uh, the stop. It's not the stop and frisk, but police officers stop a lot of the black male tours. Not, not tours, but the locals. And I didn't really understand why. But when a lot of people can't get jobs, if you've been in jail one time, a lot of them go into selling things on the street or offering private tours. They're like Hina Terrell, they're kind of like, um, mm, they kind of know everything and stuff is. But quite honestly, you're not supposed to intermingle with tourists. So a lot of them get stopped by police and questioned. I went with a lot of students, and some of them got questioned because they had backpacks and they thought that they stole their own backpacks. But once we realized we were Americans, they let us go. So I've seen it, and I've heard it. And talking to a lot of people, mentioning that they finished college, had a degree, but there are no jobs, or they won't get hired because let's say hotels want a certain look when you walk into the hotel. They'll allow you to be security officers and work in the kitchen, but you won't see a lot of people elsewhere. And I've seen it, so it's quite interesting. What do you think the future holds for Cuba? If it leans towards capitalism, I, I can see it collapsing. I just, it, there are a lot of things that work. There are a lot of wonderful things there. But if it goes towards a system where people are dependent on money, I mean, as far as the capitalistic type, the, the health care, the education, a lot of things work out. That I've never been around people that will help you and not ask for anything in return. Everyone's very smart, very educated, but there's just that greed mentality. I want to say that's how they look at capitalists. If their structure goes to that, I, I, I see a lot of problems. I don't see it going further with that. I, it's kind of its own little capsule. It, it, it functions perfectly on its own. I want to say perfectly, but it functions on its own. They're, they're censored from a lot of things. They're prevented from doing a lot of things. But in many ways, what they do see from the United States are TV shows. They ask me a lot of questions like, why do you have TV shows that do this? Why does your news not tell the truth? Why does your news talk about famous people instead of what's really happening? And I kind of want to say, I, yeah, I get what you're saying. You know, they their news is really focused on a lot of good things and things that are tr uh, problematic. But it, it's it's kind of interesting how we see how what's censored from us, um, what's censored from them, kind of protects them from, I guess, um, some of the nonsense that we've been become a part of and some of the pretty things that we've done. So. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Um, whatever came up, Carlos Moore, and um, how come after, uh, well, I mean, I know that Malcolm X was assassinated, obviously, but uh, do you think that there could have been hope for his organization, the OAAU? Yes. If, even in spite of him being assassinated? Yes, because what happened, he was assassinated in 65, what happened in 1966? Black Panther Party is founded and becomes a national organization with popular chapters and branches all over the country, all the major cities that have major black populations. So, and they often point to Malcolm X as an inspiration for them. And, uh, so, and there were other important organizations, the US organization on the West Coast with Milana Karanga, uh, Amiri Baraka who just passed away in New Jersey. All these were major uh, black figures who were inspired in part by Malcolm X. So I think uh, he, was an inspiration and could have been a participant 
in uh, the Black Power Movement uh, of the late 60s, early 70s, and uh, it's a tragedy that he was uh, killed the way he was. Carlos Moore is alive and well in Brazil. He was born in 1942. So um, he's over 70, but in good health, and um, retired. But he, he was, uh, became a university professor, scholar, and an activist. But he lived uh, most of his life, almost all of the rest of his life, outside of Cuba. He lived in France for 13 years. He lived in Africa, uh, Senegal and Nigeria, I think, for five years. He lived in the Caribbean. His parents and uh, people are from, not from Cuba, but uh, Jamaica and I think Barbados. Even though he was born and raised in Cuba, his parents were immigrants to Cuba. Uh, so he has kind of um, an international black identity. You know, speaks five, six languages and has traveled all over the world. And he has spent, I think, last 15, 16 years in Brazil. And he's still critical. He's still critical of Cuba. He was able to go back to Cuba, just like I went back as a professor taking students on study abroad. That's how he went back to Cuba. And um, he said it was, it was very tough for him because a lot of the criticisms that he had of Cuba in the 60s were still there in the 90s when he went back. I think he went back three times. And he, um, he got to see his family there. He has uh, siblings and cousins, relatives, and uh, And some of his family members are members of the Communist Party, are strong supporters of the revolution. And so he said he didn't want to talk politics, he just wanted to do family. But they had heard of him, they knew of him, so they pressed him, what are you talking about? What are all your criticisms? So he said they had some hot family discussions, but they always squashed it by saying, you know, family is more important than politics and stuff like that. So. Um, but I think he, he remains disappointed and critical of the Cuban Revolution's inability to deal completely, fundamentally, with the question of race and racism. And um, also the, um, the lack of uh, political diversity in Cuba. So in Cuba, when I was in Cuba, I. I, I met a lot of people who didn't seem to be happy with the situation, you know, because with the collapse of the Soviet Union, Cuba fell on economic hard times, big time. So people were, you know, hurting. But I also felt that people, that they didn't have an outlet for that hurt in terms of political expression because Cuba's a one party system and um, you can you cannot agree with that system. Um, you can criticize it verbally, but you can't organize. You can't organize an alternative, or you'll face the uh, constraints of the government. So uh, I think Carlos Moore saw that, and so he's still not uh, happy with it. Is he published at all? Because I mean, you yes, he's very he's very well published, and uh, I encourage you to read. His recent uh, first volume of his autobiography called Pinchon, P I C H O N. And he talks about his experience growing up in Cuba, going to uh, New York City, uh, hearing Malcolm X speak, then going, to, then going back to Cuba, and then leaving Cuba. It's a very dramatic story. He's, um, he had some life and death situations. Uh, but <coughs> many people criticize. A lot of his former friends criticized him as a 
CIA spy and a sellout. And uh, so he says, and I interviewed him. <coughs> he said, no, I was never part of the CIA. I'm not down with the CIA. And that's just something that the government threw on. Yes. Do you feel that, say, with Cuba, their biggest problem was aligning themselves with Russia instead of just building a country that dealt with all countries when it comes to, like, imports and exports, because, you know, Russia was just as bad as the United States when it comes to oppression, racism, they still are today, still are today. Well, I uh, think that, yes, it would have been nice if Cuba could have really taken its own independent path. But I think they felt the risk was too high because the United States had already um, organized and financed uh, a group of Cuban exiles to invade Cuba at the Bay of Pigs to overthrow the government. And so I don't think the, the uh, Cuban government thought that was going to be the last attempt. Just because they defeated the Cuban exiles at the Bay of Pigs I think the United States was always ready and looking for openings to overthrow the Cuban government through assassination attempts of Fidel, through um, aiding uh, Cuban exiles, and so uh, I thought I think the Cubans felt that if we ally with Russia, that's going to reduce the the opportunity because the United States will figure if they mess. Cuba, you're also messing with the Soviet Union, and so I'm assuming that's where their thinking was, but you're right, the Soviet Union, they imposed certain of their uh, conditions and ideology on Cuba, which may not have been the Cubans' first choice, yes. Okay, so would you also feel more or less like when it comes to America, it wasn't so much as the politicians that were interested in Cuba, it was more or less like that's what put it. It's the American gangsters who wanted Cuba to remain, you know, like the Las Vegas of Latin America. So, you know, just like they say, who really killed Kennedy? You know, was it some Russian plot or was it just some gangsters and Marilyn Monroe and all that type of stuff? Or maybe because Kennedy wouldn't just keep pushing the agenda of trying to get back their island paradise. Well, I hear what you're saying. But I think the uh, most American politicians are like American gangsters. <laughs> and, and yeah. In the sense that they think the world is theirs, that we can do what we want to do. We can intervene in the country. We can overthrow a country. We can assassinate a leader. That's how American, high level American. Uh, government officials and politicians think. And so that's a problem. And that's what Malcolm X was so critical of. And, and we have the, um, the tragic evidence of that in Vietnam. The American War in Vietnam, 65, 1965, 1975, over 50,000 American troops are killed. Two to three million Vietnamese people are killed. Two to three million people are killed, and no apology, no reparations to the Vietnamese, no, I'm sorry. So that's, that's gangster. That's like, you know, it's like. Okay, but that, also that like, you mentioned the Vietnam and talking about Russia. When Vietnam had their communist revolution, look how they built their country up and look where it's at today. And saying if Cuba would have maybe, you know, aligned but controlled the interest of the American gangsters who wanted to be there, maybe they might have been a little better off, maybe not politically, but you know, financially. Well that's what well, well, that's what people well the question now is what is Cuba gonna do now? Some people feel that Cuba wants to be like Vietnam or China in the sense that they have a one party system which is controlling things politically. But they, they uh, have more openness on the economic business front. So you have a more dynamic economy. Um, and so Vietnam and China, in some respects, are very prosperous now. 
Whereas Cuba, you don't, when you go over to Cuba, you don't feel that a lot is going on. Even though I think more is going on. You said you don't think that's going to be a positive outcome, but I think... Uh, you know, but I was going to say to this gentleman, you might forget that after the blockade, there were a lot of, um, the Helms Burton Act, there were a couple compacts that the government made so that other countries couldn't trade for, with them. So it's kind of like if you talk to them, we're going to cut you off. Yeah. That's why they couldn't trade with anybody. So it's kind of like they're on this side of the hemisphere and they can't talk to anybody. And so while they had this um, the refinery, it was easier to have Russia send their oil to them, to um, the crude oil, to process it, and they sent them sugar in return. So they had a good relationship going back and forth, but yeah, you're right, after the collapse, they couldn't really do anything. And they haven't been able to do a whole lot because I think that there's so many countries against them because they kind of want to keep nice with the United States that they weren't able to do a whole lot. And I'm not saying that I don't think that they would collapse, but what I was saying earlier was that there are a lot of people with their private businesses, but some of them, if they're, they're, they're I want to say some of them, once they get enough money, they just want to sell everything and leave the country. So it's kind of like that brain drain thing going on that happened in some other places where all the intellectuals left an area, everyone with money or resources left an area, and you're kind of left with, you know, a bunch of nothing. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Uh, I'm curious how much of Malcolm's support for the uh, Cuban Revolution was based on kind of anti-imperialism, anti-U.S. kind of oppression in general, and how much was based on the tenets, the support of the tenets of communism and anti-capitalism. Because um, he doesn't, it doesn't seem like he kind of articulates an anti-capitalist position quite as as clearly as like the Black Panthers that came later. Right, yeah, and I think Malcolm supports um, Cuban Revolution because he's uh, uh, anti-imperialist, fundamentally, and he sees the Cuban Revolution as a blow to American imperialism. I think he's very impressed that with the things that the Cuban Revolution does in the early years, in terms of, like I said, land reform, literacy campaign, uh, commitment to health care. So these are all dramatic measures, including anti-racist measures, banning segregation, outlawing racial discrimination. These are things that occur in the first few years of the revolution. Malcolm hears about these and is excited about, just like Carlos Warren, people around the world are excited about them. Uh, I think Malcolm is critical of capitalism. Uh, he feels that most of the uh, progressive forces are more socialist or communist with the new uh, emerging uh, nations of Africa, the revolutionary movements in Latin America. Uh, but yeah, he doesn't have the opportunity to fully articulate his uh, ideology. Uh, he meets a lot of uh, top leaders in 64 when he travels through Africa, the Middle East, and uh, Europe. So he's very uh, impressed with them but he also sees contradictions between the discourse and the reality. And so, again, I see those last two years, very two, three years as transitional years from the Nation of Islam to something else that really wasn't able to be. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Yes. Um, it's one of the main criticisms of the Cuban Revolution was it didn't address race and the racism in the Cuban society. What were certain leaders in Cuba trying to accomplish when they reached out to the black communities in Harlem and different things like that? What was their objective? Well, it's clear that Cuban revolutionaries have always been about solidarity, that they've always felt that it was their duty given their successful revolution to support uh, movements for social change in the United States and other parts of the world in spirit of solidarity. They also calculated that the more friends we have around the world, the more difficult it will be for other countries like the United States to uh, intervene in our country and um, try to overthrow us. So um, 
one of the main things that Cuba is known for now is for its um, healthcare system. And uh, so it has, it produces a lot of doctors and healthcare professionals, and they serve all over the world, in the Caribbean, in Latin America, uh, assisting countries that don't invest as much in healthcare. Give you an example. Brazil, the largest country in Latin America, 200 million people has imported Cuban doctors and nurses and healthcare officials to go to some of the most uh, poor and uh, out of the way places in Brazil to provide healthcare service because the elitist healthcare structure in Brazil doesn't, they have doctors but they don't want to go to those outposts. So uh, that's a way that Cuba has uh, built solidarity with different forces around the world. Um, what was the point you made about racism or something? Like, it seems like that was the main criticism of the Cuban Revolution, like, um, that it wasn't addressing the issues of race. But in one sense, it seems like if they're meeting with the black leaders in Harlem, they they are somewhat invested in the question of race. Well, let me, let me clarify. I wouldn't say that Cuba didn't address the issue of race. They addressed the issue of race uh, in terms of condemning racism, in terms of condemning racial segregation uh, in Cuba. Now, people like Carlos Moore and some other Cuban leaders, they liked that, but they said it wasn't enough. You can't just say racism <coughs> is illegal now and then uh, not talk about it. Because the Cuban government, they, they almost banned discussion of racism after they banned racial discrimination. And so Carlos Swan was all, always critical that that wasn't the right approach. It's good that you make segregation illegal. It's good that you make racial discrimination illegal. But we still have, that doesn't mean all of racism goes away. <coughs> so that was a problem. But it's interesting you should say that because at a time when Cuba was almost banning internal discussion of racism within Cuba. It was celebrating leaders like Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, Robert Williams, a former leader of the NACP, Negroes with Guns, uh, a number of Black Panthers received exile in Cuba. So some scholars argue that Cuba had a, a kind of dual policy didn't want to deal with race and black political autonomy domestically within Cuba at the same time that it celebrated and embraced some of the most powerful black leaders internationally. And so Carlos Moore and others see that as a contradiction, uh, a way to say, see, I'm not racist. Stokely Carmichael's my friend. Robert Williams is my friend. Uh, the Black Panther Party's are my friend. But you can't, you can't form a Black Panther Party in Cuba. See, we can't have that. We're, we're, we're different from the United States. So we're, you don't have to have a black political organization independent of the government here in Cuba because we're different. So that, that's kind of an ongoing tension, I would say, in Cuba, in terms of lack of Cubans being able to create organizations which are fundamentally independent of or in opposition to the government. Any other questions, comments? <laughs> Walter, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. As thank usual, you for, it's for always stimulating lecture. So enjoyable. Wonderful young audience for coming, yes. and listening, and the, the questions were insightful. I'm Let's impressed. See, we have a Right group of people here. I, I want to encourage they would consider everybody. coming to some more of the humanity centers uh, programs. Uh, we want to encourage students on campus to consider our Brown Back series and our conferences to be uh, intellectual resources. Yes. Not just your classes. You don't just come to school to go to class, but to take advantage of what's available. Uh, during this four years, five years that you spend here on campus, so that when you leave, you are nurtured fully 
uh, with what the what the university has to offer. So uh, come on. And many of them will be here tomorrow. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> 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 I can't see that dumb.